That's yeah. actually good. All right. So, sorry for this. Um, sorry for this. Uh, uh, I don't know delay. So, as uh, uh, Joe Maretsky was, we were discussing about a moment ago. You know, this is a new disease. Uh, and we are actually uh, 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 seeing the development. So what I'm going to talk about today is not universal science. This is just new discovery, and this is uh, uh, what we found. So I'm going to talk about two things. The first one is that diabetes uh, is a risk factor for severe COVID-19 outcomes mostly uh, in an acute setting. And the second one is uh, COVID-19 as a risk factor for new onset diabetes. And, and this time um, in an acute setting and PASC. So wh why was I interested in, uh, I'm gonna have to move. Why was I interested in COVID-19? Obviously I'm not a, um, an infectious disease specialist. Uh, I am an endocrinologist. Well, there are two reasons for that. Uh, the first one is that uh, I'm very interested in uh, how uh, sex is a modifier of disease and medicine, <clears throat> especially diabetes, because I work on diabetes. And right at the beginning of the first uh, surge, you know, at the beginning of 2020, um, we started to, to, to realize even before it was published that there were mostly men that were hospitalized and mostly men that were dying. I mean, originally it was the newspapers who were speaking about that. So I started doing a project with uh, Sabra Klein and Hopkins and uh, we, we, we pulled actually the data from the uh, New York Department of Health and published first paper. And we found that, you know, hospitalization and deaths were much higher in, uh, in men. In fact, uh, subsequently, it was clear uh, that uh, if you look at uh, the list of all the countries here that uh, regarding fatality, regarding mortality, uh, uh, but it's also true for admission to ICU, intubation, etc., there are approximately two thirds were men. So the second thing that uh, triggered my interest is that globally also uh, people were speaking about the people who were hospitalized. They were not those with mostly with heart disease or chronic pulmonary disease. I mean, you're talking about a viral pneumonia, but the people who were hospitalized were not those in predominance who had uh, chronic pulmonary disease or heart disease. They were people who had metabolic disease specifically obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. This slide here is the, one of the first big paper from New York uh, City in the JAMA. And you see, I mean, obesity, 42% are hospitalized, diabetes, 34%. People with metabolic syndrome represented here by hypertension, 57. But those with chronic pulmonary disease and heart disease, about half the, the, about half the, the prevalence of uh, those with metabolic disease. Showing you just a second example, the first study released from uh, Oshner Hospital in New Orleans, a different population than ours here at Tulane because they are more, uh, they, are, they are healthier and wealthier. But you can see that the same thing can be uh, observed. Most hospitalized patients had uh, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension, but twice as much as those with heart disease or chronic pulmonary disease. I remember at the time I was looking at the Louisiana Department of Health every week because they were updating their, uh, their website every week and the same thing happened. Actually, this is the last time I, I, I looked at that, you see, in uh, February 21. But uh, uh, the data was even more uh, impressive uh, in 2020, but you see diabetes, 37% of death, this of death compared with uh, pulmonary 14%, <clears throat> cardiac disease 26%. So the question is why are me metabolic disease more uh, dangerous for people with COVID-19 than uh, heart disease? <clears throat> so Josh Denson uh, in pulmonary at Tulane uh, 
uh, spearheaded the first uh, uh, study taking, taking, uh, looking at all the patients from Tulane School of Med uh, Tulane uh, Hospital and University Medical Center, which is the county hospital affiliated with Tulane and LSU. And it clearly showed the same thing, you know, that uh, in our population, we had uh, a huge prevalence of uh, people with a, a hypertension, you see 80% obesity uh, and diabetes 53. Compared with those with uh, chronic pulmonary disease or heart disease, much less. So obviously, why diabetes is dangerous, uh, it is known for a lot of diseases, not just COVID-19. I mean, if you're hospitalized with severe hyperglycemia, you're more likely to die, you know, because of uh, hyperglycemia uh, leads to multiple complications, uh, including uh, immune depression, uh, <clears throat> etc. But here's a first study done, uh, uh, you know, uh, from multiple group in China, including the Huan uh, group. And um, what they what they found, try to move here, that clearly you see um, if you have a blood glucose at admission that is considered well well controlled for them, it's not really well controlled. Under ten millimolar, which is about two hundred milligram per dl, um, your risk of dying is about one person. But if you have over ten millimolar, uh, it's about eleven person. In other words, if you have uh, uncontrolled diabetes your risk of death is 10 times higher. Another study, uh, there are many of them, but I just showed two of them. Here they looked at type two and type one, and they, here it's represented as the uh, forest plot with that um, uh, uh, auto ratio showing the risk. If it's on the right, there's an increased risk. If it's on the left, there's a decreased risk. And they looked at glycated hemoglobin for those of you who are not familiar with glycated hemoglobin, this is um, a measurement of because uh, uh, hemoglobin half-life is uh, three months. This is a measurement that the percent of hemoglobin glycated represent, you know, the average of chronic hyperglycemia over the last three months. And you see that for type two, as glycated hemoglobin increase, therefore has diabetes becomes less controlled while the risk of death uh, uh, increases. The same thing for type one, except it's less significant, you know, that uh, 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 deviation uh, crosses the midline because 90% of the people are type two, not type one. <clears throat> but what is interesting in both cases, you see those who are highly controlled under 6.5, actually an increased risk of death it's not explained in the paper, but I uh, interpret that as the fact that if you're too well controlled and you become hypoglycemic, of course, you uh, have a risk of death from, uh, you know, a stroke, etc. The second reason why people uh, with type 2 diabetes are predisposed to death is that 80% of people with diabetes uh, are overweight or obese, okay? And uh, here I'm going to show you just two studies. Uh, this is a Chinese one uh, because uh, it's very representative. You see that as the BMI, the body mass index increases, uh, you know, a normal person is between 20 and 25. As you increase, there's a linear uh, correlation with mortality. Um, and uh, so for example, 30 is obesity, 40 is severe obesity. And if you have, let's say, uh, uh, let's say 22 here, uh, your risk of mortality is about, uh, is about 20%. But let's say if you have severe obesity, your risk uh, is about 60%. <clears throat> this is a study done at Tulane at the beginning. Uh, and you see the same thing, you know, when your BMI increased by five points, your uh, odd ratio, your risk of, uh, of admission to ICU is by uh, increased by 1.7, but it's, if it increases by 10, let's say you go from 25 to 35, uh, it increases by almost threefold. So obesity, fat is a risk for uh, 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 severe COVID-19. The question is why? 
Well, we don't have time to uh, uh, discuss this, but I was uh, asked uh, early in the disease uh, because I was interested in sex and I, was int and I work on diabetes to uh, write a perspective in uh, the journal, uh, 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 the journal Diabetes here. <laughs> and this is how I summarized it. Now, let me say, this is not universal knowledge, but that's the way I see it. The people who died for COVID-19, and we're talking about 2020, you know, when people were not vaccinated uh, uh, and there was no uh, uh, gamma, um, uh, <laughs> I'm already at the gamma uh, delta variant. Uh, and so the people who were dying were older, uh, over 65. They were male and they were obese, okay, and diabetic. So one possibility is that when you're uh, obese, you know, you have more fat. And we know that first of all, people who are dying from COVID-19 from the uh, so-called uh, cytokine storm. Uh, the cytokine storm is characterized within the lungs by uh, an inappropriate uh, 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 myeloid cell infiltration and inappropriate innate immune response. Where for example, macrophages are uh, secreting an excessive amount of uh, pro-inflammatory chemokines and cytokines and cytokines. But if you're young uh, and you're lean, and let's say you're uh, not a male, well, you know, you're going to have a, a, a severe flu and, or even nothing, and it's going to subside. But if you're obese, what happens is that obesity in itself, uh, in fact, there is already uh, an innate immune, uh, and not only innate immune, but infiltration of macrophage and myeloid cells um, that are already pro-inflammatory pro and produce a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the blood. Here I showed the IL-6, but there are a lot of others. And it creates systemic low-grade inflammation, meta-inflammation that of course can go to the lung, exacerbate the macrophage inflammation. Another interesting thing is that Obese people have hyperleptinemia and leptin is actually a pro-inflammatory cytokine. It's actually an IL-6 mimetic. There are papers showing that um, in non-COVID ARDS, non-COVID acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, leptin uh, acts in the lungs to actually damage the lung uh, 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 parenchyma. So obviously this is probably a factor. The other thing is that, as I said, male sex is involved and uh, it is known that men have actually, uh, it's known from rodent models and from clinical studies, men have actually a pro-inflammatory uh, uh, innate immune response. Uh, and therefore they have a, a, a kind of meta-inflammation compared to women. But also aging uh, is characterized by an absence of flexibility of the immune system called inflammation, inflammaging, where there is also a, a higher level of pro-inflammatory cytokine. So if you take that together, uh, being old, male, and obese, create what I call a perfect storm that would, of course, uh, uh, you know, target these uh, innate immune cells to exacerbate and promote this cytokine storm. This is a possibility. <clears throat> All right, so like I said, we did this first study uh, with Josh Denson, uh, and we found uh, that at Tulane, uh, there were more uh, people with uh, metabolic disease and diabetes uh, are dying. So we then looked at, uh, performed a second study with more people, you know, we, we took, thought I was six months down the road, <clears throat> till in 2020, uh, still the first surge, uh, to almost 800 people. And we looked how diabetes and other comorbidities influence mortality. But this time we uh, disaggregated, we stratified the data by sex and race. <clears throat> so first of all, what we found is that unlike in other studies, we didn't have a male predominance. If anything, the female uh, non-significantly were more prevalent in uh, hospitalization. But what we found, and of course, we didn't have like a lot of studies. Uh, we had a permanently a uh, 75% non-Hispanic black population. You see the non-Hispanic whites were a minority. <clears throat> now, in this population, unlike uh, what we found was that women, 
were not protected, like I said, but women were, uh, were sicker. They were not as healthy as the male. Uh, you see, they were more obese. They were more, they had more diabetes. They had more hypertension. They had more uh, chronic pulmonary disease, etc. <clears throat> so what we did was to look at the predictors of, uh, of uh, death in uh, multivariate analysis. And we found something very interesting is that, for example, diabetes uh, compared to non-diabetic people, you see was a predictor of death. Again, this is a, um, a forest plot. But you see that um, uh, when you um, stratify by sex was a predictor of death in our population, only in women, not in men. <clears throat> when the when the confidence interval crosses the midline, it's not significant. <clears throat> and also chronic kidney disease was a predictor of death in women and not in men. Now, what is interesting is that, see, if we had done the analysis without stratifying by sex, we would have missed the whole thing because you see, uh, 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 when you look at the uh, uh, overall population, it's significant. But when you stratify by sex, the amplitude increases in, in, in women. So it, it demonstrates, first of all, the importance of stratifying by sex because the argument that by stratifying by sex will decrease your uh, significance is not true. Actually, if something has a sex dimorphism, it will increase the significance. If it doesn't have a sex um, a dimorphism, it will decrease the significance, but then you'll know it. Now, the same thing was observed, whether you look at uh, non-Hispanic black uh, uh, and uh, uh, non-black non-Hispanic population, you see females, women were predisposed to death when they were diabetic, not men. Uh, in the non-Hispanic, uh, in the non-black population, it didn't reach significance because of course we didn't have power enough. So at the same time, I was, um, I was uh, working uh, with friends and colleagues in France and overseeing a study um, uh, over uh, 58 centers, over 3,000 people. I, you know, they had uh, the coronary, coronado cohort. They had already published a paper on the overall population that proposed them to look by sex uh, in a larger population. And what we found was that we looked at so they were all diabetic, the patient. They all had diabetes. We looked at death and other uh, severe outcome at day seven and day 28. And among people who uh, had diabetes, you see that at day seven, like in the normal population, uh, men were more likely to die significantly. That we already knew that. Um, but when we looked at day 28, the male predominance in death was uh, not significant anymore, it was gone. What he suggests is that, and if you did the same thing in a non-diabetic population, uh, the male uh, predominance would have stayed the same. What it suggests is that, like in the study that I showed you before here, uh, being uh, the fact of being the protection of women was actually erased by the fact of being a diabetic. <clears throat> Here I'm coming back of the first study at Tulane, but what, and this is not related to diabetes, but I wanted to show you that because it's interesting in terms of predictor. We looked at all the biomarkers, you know, all these are the classical biomarkers. Some of them were predictors of death in men and women, LDH, you know, markers of hypoxia, uh, procalcitonin, marker of severe infection, troponin, marker of heart disease, a BNP, another marker of infection, uh, sorry, another marker of heart dysfunction. Um, and they were all similar in men and women. But we found that D-dimer, you know, D-dimer is a marker of increased coagulation, which is used, for example, to diagnose uh, deep venous thrombosis. Um, it was a marker, a predictor of death only in men, not in women, clearly not in women in our population. But conversely, ferritin, um, a marker of uh, inflammation, macrophage activation, was a predictor of death in women and not in men. And so was, importantly, the uh, neutrophil over lymphocyte ratio, which is a, a 
a marker of lymphopenia. You see a predictor of death in women, but not in men. So the first taking point I would like to make is that you, you see there's a sex difference in the clinical and uh, biological determinants of a uh, severe COVID-19 outcome, at least during the acute phase, because here we're talking about the first month in which diabetes, chronic kidney disease, ferritin, and the uh, NLR ratio are independent predictor of death in women. And here I'm talking about the population of New Orleans and for diabetes. Uh, we saw that in, in, in France, but it's not uh, as clear. D-dimer was an independent predictor of death in men, but not in women. So uh, if anything, it shows you the importance of stratifying data by sex uh, for clinical studies. Now, what about the second part, uh, the new onset diabetes and COVID-19, which is more relevant to PASC? <clears throat> so, you know, uh, there were a lot of uh, papers that started to be uh, released starting in 2020 because uh, investigators realized that a lot of people hospitalized for COVID-19 developed uh, new onset diabetes, or at least it was not known before. And then they had also acute pancreatitis. Uh, it was not known if it was due to COVID-19 because, of course, when you're hospitalized in a severe condition, you can have both. So people have started to look, first of all, at the uh, uh, ACE2 receptor for SARS-CoV-2 in the pancreas. And uh, there were a lot of, at the beginning, of uh, uh, conflicting results, um, some showing that there's no, res no, no ACE2 in the islet cells. But of course, there's a lot of ACE2 in the ducts and in the endothelial cells. Um, some starting to show that uh, the beta cells are not enriched in ACE2, but uh, you know you can see some ACE2 in the beta cells, and uh, uh, and of course uh, it was always shown in the endothelial cells and, and the ducts. But then some studies starting to show that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is actually uh, infecting uh, and replicating in vitro in the uh, endocrine and uh, exocrine cells of the pancreas. That in fact, when you put human islets in culture and human cells in culture, it actually induced a transdifferentiation of the beta cell. Now, what does it mean? A transdifferentiation of the beta cell, meaning they lose their uh, identity as beta cell. And you know, the uh, ID of a beta cell is to produce insulin. So if it's transdifferentiated, it means it does not produce insulin. So of course, a beta cell that does not produce insulin is useless because it can lead to diabetes. At the same time, we were doing a study that I want to show you before, but these big papers, uh, um, which actually did not show much causality inside, were pro uh, produced another one showing a, a clear viral infiltration of violets. And beta cell and, and patients with uh, with COVID nineteen, but during the last two papers, we are actually working in a study in collaboration with many investigators of the Primate Center, uh, which I will uh, acknowledge afterwards, and uh, and as well as uh, uh, using um, 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 uh, sections from. Uh, patients uh, deceased from COVID-19 that we got from LSU. And um, Fat Kadir, actually a very uh, talented uh, uh, fellow uh, in, uh, in, in my lab was uh, leading that study. We had uh, four controlled primates and uh, eight infected. And we had six sections from uh, uh, non-COVID patients and uh, five sections from patient deceased from COVID-19. First, we looked at ACE2 expression in uh, primate, uh, which you can see, unfortunately, it's not very big. I don't know. Um, here, what you can see, this is ACE2, and in, in green, you got, uh, you got beta cell. You can see that ACE2 is clearly, in fact, um, expressing beta cells of uh, primates, uh, normal primates. It's also actually here, you see, in alpha cells that produce glucagon. And of course, it was present in um, primate large ducts. Here's uh, 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 CK19 and, uh, and small ducts.
But interestingly, uh, in infected primates, it was present in small dogs, but it's it was totally absent, here's the quantification, in the large ducts. I, I have no idea why, but this is an interesting observation. It was actually published by another paper. In human pancreata, ACE2 was also expressed here. This is an islet, you know, stained with the uh, glucagon insulin, all the cells of the uh, uh, endocrine pancreas. Uh, you see ACE2 in green here, uh, clearly expressed in a beta cell here. And uh, uh, here too, and here in uh, in alpha cells, uh, and of course it was express, expressed in uh, in ductal cells here in, uh, in in humans. Now we looked also at uh, of course SARS-CoV-2 infection, looking at the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, nucleocapsid uh, protein, and uh, here's an islet from primates. You see the beta cell have uh, disappeared a little bit, um, which I will come back to later because some primate became diabetic, so it's possibly they were destroyed. But what we see in this section, for example, here, we didn't find in this primate, for example, infection of uh, directly of the beta cells, but we found infection of a lot of uh, endothelial cells inside the islet. So the, the microvasculature of the islets was clearly infected by uh, the virus. Um, here's a, uh, here's are the ducts, clear infection of the ducts. Here is the, uh, endothelium, clear infection of the primate endothelium inside the pancreas. Same thing in humans. We found infection of all the, end, all the endocrine, exocrine and endothelial cells. Again, you see the beta cells um, uh, are, I mean, the islets are a little bit, um, they have lost a lot of uh, nuclei. So it's possible that uh, uh, they lost a lot of cells, maybe because of the pancreas preparation. Remember these are autopsies. But in any case, what we see here is uh, infection of, uh, of uh, here in uh, um, uh, a beta cell, because you have a yellow, you have red, and green in the beta cell. So it, this beta cell was infected here too. And here uh, again, another beta cell infected. So the, the cell producing insulin are infected. Um, and the same thing here. Uh, of course, we found infection of ducts and major infection of the endothelial cells all, all over the pancreas, you know, in all of, of them. I, I, I'm hiding you, but these are the these are the quantification of each of the disease patients. Now, it's not surprising that the, the endothelial cells are infected because a lot of people have shown infection. And uh, this is a study um, uh, done by uh, uh, Xu Quinn at the Primate Center in Tulane and uh, with J. Coles and uh, Jera Puppet. And uh, uh, we found a lot of, uh, I mean, there was, uh, endothelial cell infection, and there was uh, uh, also indirect uh, endothelial cell uh, dysfunction uh, via immune um, uh, activation. Now, very importantly, we looked at the consequence at the whole pancreas level. And um, what we found uh, is that here are the primates. There were a lot of, compared with the controlled primates, not infected. Uh, there were a lot of uh, micro trombi in micro vessels. You know, here's the quantification. And it was actually when we stain with uh, um, microcyrus red, you know, a marker of uh, extracellular matrix, in other words, a microfibrosis, we found a lot of fibrosis in the pancreas. So in primates, there's uh, thrombosis and fibrosis of the pancreas uh, in those infected with SARS CoV 2. Same thing in humans, uh, a lot of microtrombi everywhere, uh, quantified here, and a lot of, um, and an increased uh, rate of fibrosis in the pancreas, uh, as well as uh, here we uh, stain with uh, ICAM, uh, as well as uh, inflammation of the endothelial cells of the pancreas of human disease, endothelitis. 
So, I mean, you have fibrosis and thrombosis of the pancreas. This is pretty, uh, a pretty big risk of uh, pancreas dysfunction. Uh, another interesting thing is that we found, um, this is a picture I took on, um, on Google to show you, uh, but here are our data. And we found that uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 was actually present in, uh, you know, in microvesicles here in, uh, in uh, ductal cells and here in endothelial cells. Um, what is very interesting, I hope you can see uh, um, well, but here this little uh, um, uh, a vesicle, you know, a lot of virus, we can see the red arrow. We can actually see the, the spikes, the spikes of the virus. See, they are here in vesicles, uh, ready to be uh, exported. They are hijacking the machinery of the cells, uh, presumably to be exported somewhere. But interestingly, uh, among the primates from the primate center, uh, and uh, uh, especially the African green monkeys, uh, you know, out, out of four African green monkeys that were infected, three of them, you see, developed hyperglycemia. And they were not hyperglycemic before, suggesting that SARS-CoV-2 led to new onset diabetes in these primates. Um, yeah, you see the controls, none of them. And in the um, patients that we had, so we had control sections, and we had um, uh, uh, patients with COVID-19. Um, out of five patients with COVID-19, two of them developed uh, uh, severe hyperglycemia uh, after admission, uh, which was not known before. There was no history of diabetes. So it suggests that in male uh, and female primates and in uh, men and women with COVID-19, the infection could predisposed to new onset diabetes. So, oh man, the, the conclusion of this second story is that you see, uh, we found uh, the virus in the islet cells, including the beta cell producing insulin, the ductal cells of the pancreas, the exocrine pancreas, the blood vessels of the pancreas, and this leads to thrombosis and fibrosis of the pancreas. So, I mean, what I would like to say uh, to conclude that is that thrombo and fibrosis of the pancreas is very likely to uh, cause in the long run, you know, uh, in the context of PASC, an ischemic pancreas. And it will be interesting uh, to look in the long run at uh, the potential development of diabetes, but also of exocrine pancreas dysfunction, you know, uh, maybe they're going to develop a new form of, uh, of uh, uh, chronic pancreat, subacute chronic pancreatitis and uh, associated with diabetes. Uh, I don't know, but it would be interesting to look at that. So these are the people who uh, collaborated in these studies. I mean, of course, uh, uh, Fab Kadir and Yilin uh, spearheaded the two uh, uh, studies, clinical and, and, and uh, in primates and humans. Josh Denson uh, was very important in uh, uh, collecting the cohorts at Tulane. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, the primate center, Tracy Fisher, uh, we had a very, very, uh, uh, she was instrumental uh, in uh, leading the study with the, the primate, Lara, Don Mayers, uh, um, thanks to her, we had um, meticulous control of diabetes in all the primates. Of course, uh, I skip J. Uh, and also, we uh, were lucky to have very talented students, medical students, who had to collect the, the data. Scott Gillette, Margot Brown, um, very talented um, uh, clinical fellows, Sarah Wilson, uh, and of course, a lot of collaborators. And, of course, I forgot to acknowledge uh, Richard uh, van der Heide, who, uh, without whom we would not have any uh, pancreas section. At the time, it was, uh, um, uh, it was at LSU Health Science Center, uh, the chair of uh, uh, pathology. I think he moved to Wisconsin. And that's what I have to say. 
Uh, so I'd be happy to answer uh, any question. And I apologize again for that, uh, that little problem at the beginning. Thank you. That was terrific. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mavais Jarvis. Um, Jay, do you wanna um, lead things off or you have any questions and we could, we could start taking, yeah. if there are any questions, uh, we yeah. will start looking at them in the um, in the uh, chat and in the Q and A. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Joe. So while, while people can put some questions in the chat, um, I have a I have a question myself. Um, you know, given the, the connection between inflammation, diabetes, and COVID, um, you know, what 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 about the you know metformin as a treatment? What do you what do you feel about that, and can you give some insights there? This is actually a very very good question. Um, I I never thought about that, uh, but uh, as we discussed uh, several times, I mean, metformin is like a magic potion, right? So, <laughs> you know, it's the only drug that had uh, one of the only drug and cheapest drug that has uh, decreased cardiovascular mortality in diabetes. Now, it, you know, it's uh, good in cancer. It prevents aging. So why not COVID-19? And it acts via mysterious mechanism uh, with NAD and uh, AMP kinase and other things. So it's actually a pretty good idea. I hope, I, I, I hope somebody will uh, look into that. I think we should look into that in primates. Absolutely. Joe, do you know any studies on metformin in humans? I do not. I, I think know if you're asking be... me, but Josh? Yeah, Josh? I think uh, to, to continue answering my question, if I remember well, there, there is a study from uh, UAB. There's a clinical study from UAB looking at metformin in uh, in patient in mortality, and I think there's a uh, published not a long time ago, and I think there's a small decrease in in, in mortality in COVID patients uh, taking metformin in diabetic COVID patient taking metformin, if I remember well, from UAB. Yeah, yeah that's like Josh, that sounds right. I, uh, I'd have to do a deeper dive into the, the metformin and COVID literature. But, but as you say, Dr. Ovis Jarvis, there's, there's tremendous interest in this. And, um, and if, uh, I, I suspect we'll see more activity around that in the very near future. That's my guess. In the Coronado study, the French big study over 3,000 patients, we didn't find any difference in male or in female. Interesting. Any other question? So I'm curious, uh, just your thoughts on the, you showed some uh, risk factors like D-dimer and ferritin and others and that were different between women and men. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts? But is there any uh, hypotheses? Do you have any hypotheses as to why D-dimers might be, you know, significantly showing some significant, some, you know, uh, sexual dimorphism differences like that or where, where they're coming from? Uh, I have a better uh, hypothesis about the other. Why, why would uh, <laughs> lymphopenia would uh, be more de de uh, lethal in, in women. You know, we know now that women have a better, uh, stronger immune response to viruses and a stronger immune response actually to uh, vaccination, including uh, COVID-19, there are papers. So you can uh, speculate that if women have a stronger immune response than men, uh, they rely on their immune response. Uh, and if they have uh, lymphopenia, they will be more easily affected than men uh, by uh, not being able to mount that immune response. Regarding um, D-dimer, uh, I don't know, but 
you know, men are more predisposed to cardiovascular disease. So, I mean, I guess if they have increased coagulation, this is going to exacerbate the, the story. The problem with all these studies is that we look at mortality, but what does it mean mortality? We don't look at the cause, the exact cause of that mort acute mortality. So, I mean, a, a very large study looking at the exact causes of mortality and the biomarkers uh, that uh, you know predict those different causes would be interesting. So we do have a question in the Q and A, um, and actually some chats. But the, the Q and A question is uh, is directed towards vaccination and uh, thoughts on whether vaccination might protect from the complications in the, the pancreas and diabetes and diabetes that. Um, that we're seeing and and particularly in people with breakthrough COVID-19 um, or secondary COVID-19 uh, infections. Thoughts on that? Well, I have no idea if uh, the vaccination protects the pancreas, but what I know is that the vaccination protects from the infection. Hmm. That's all I can say. Right. Might be something worth looking at in the future yeah. is to see how, how, you know, the the breakthroughs, if they are seeing the pancreas as a, as, as you know, like, a, like it's the first time or whether it's uh, somehow reduced. Um, so we have uh, notes uh, from the question from uh, Dr. Karshad saying that there are some small studies that suggest uh, reduced morbidity um, in COVID-19 with metformin. Uh, Judith Hochman uh, describes it their 19 trial reported trends toward benefit of SGLT inhibitors. So that's um, another uh, SGLT. That might be the second um, magic uh, uh, potion. It seems like they help a lot of a lot of stuff. So we keep a look at that. Um, so that's a that's another um, interesting uh, being tested in two new trials. Uh, so uh, and recover. So uh, any other questions? I see Matt Freeman. Uh, toward that question, is there a connection between viral load and respiratory and the respiratory system and severity disease in, in pancreas? Is there any way to to um, understand? You know, are the is the load? This is actually kind of a a a, a good question, um, and maybe extend it. I'll extend out a little bit more. We do see that not everybody gets every organ. Um, you know, damage uh, or effects in every organ. Is there anything to suggest that there may be some targeting or is, is, is there a direct correlation between viral load in the, in the lung and how likely that would be to, to see in the pancreas or the liver or the heart or any, the brain, um, any of the other? I think it's, you, you could ask that same question about it, all the other systems as well that we're talking about. Well, I, I, I don't know about that. I don't know of any story about uh, uh, any data about that re related to the pancreas. For the other organ, I'm not a, a, an expert, but uh, I would presume uh, that the viral load is directly uh, correlated to the dissemination of the virus in multiple organs. The question is, how does it, the virus uh, goes uh, infects epithelial cells from the lungs and epithelial cells from the digestive tract, you know, it comes from the outside. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how does it reach the pancreas? People don't know about that, but uh, I'm not a, a, an infectious disease specialist, but when I see the virus in endothelial cells, in secretory vesicle, or what I, what looked like secretory vesicle, um, you know, it, it would basically be able to infect everything, be released in the circulation and infect everything since the, the ACE2 is everywhere. <clears throat> right. As soon as you get into the, into the bloodstream, yeah. everywhere. It, it could be through the gut, you know, because I know in the animal ex monkey experiments, we saw it in the gut after it was in the, or at a later time than in the lungs, you know, and, possibly uh, through translocation into the bloodstream from there, it could reach other blood sites, you know, or directly through the lung, but it, 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 it could be dissemination through, through the gut. 
Okay. So we are now at eleven at top of the hour. I uh, I um, I think we've we've uh, don't have any more questions that have uh, come through. Um, uh, Dr. Moves Jar Jarvis, I want to thank you again. Sorry for the, uh, the the difficulty in the beginning, but I'm glad we got through your seminar and uh, and had a chance to have some some questions and and discussion. And uh, it's given us some some more things to think about and some more data. This is great great talk, um, and appreciate all of that. So. Yeah, huge thank you to everyone and uh, and everyone who, who called in and asked questions and is here. Thank you for joining. And uh, we will be uh, moving on to uh, the next seminar in, a, in about a week, and we'll talk to you all soon. Again, Andy, thank thanks. you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time and your, your work. Jay, thank you very much. Josh, great. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Bye-bye now. Thank you.